Welcome to History of Health Information Technology in the U.S., History of Electronic Health Records. This is Lecture A, Early EHR Prototypes. The objectives for this unit, History of Electronic Health Records, are to describe some early examples of electronic medical records, discuss lessons learned from the early EHR implementations, discuss how the attributes that were identified for a computer-based patient record in the 1991 Institute of Medicine report relate to the concept of meaningful use, discuss differences between the terms electronic health record, EHR, and personal health record, PHR. Before we begin, and to avoid confusion, we need to look at some of the early terminology around electronic health records. Some of the earliest systems were referred to as medical information systems. When the 1991 IOM report came out, it used the term computer-based patient record, and until recently, that was the preferred term. This term was preferred because there were people who claimed that a document that had mainly scanned images of paper documents is an electronic medical record. More recently, the term electronic health record, or EHR, seems to have subsumed all the other terms. In 2008, with funding from the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, the National Alliance for Health Information Technology, or NAHIT, came up with definitions that made distinctions among electronic medical records, electronic health records, and personal health records. Although the alliance has since disbanded, the definitions it assigned still make sense. According to NAHIT, an electronic medical record is an electronic record of health-related information on an individual that can be created, gathered, managed, and consulted by authorized clinicians and staff within one healthcare organization. The focus is on use in a single organization. NAHIT's definition of an electronic health record has two additional key features. It conforms to national standards for interoperability, and it spans more than one organization. Interoperability is the ability of systems to transmit and receive information from other systems. This describes the lifetime medical record that was envisioned from the earliest attempts at building an EHR. Although it is not mentioned here specifically, some definitions of EHR also include the opportunity for patient input. Finally, there is the personal health record, or PHR. This has also been called the personally controlled health record. The important point here is that it is controlled by the individual, that is, the patient or their caregiver. In this presentation, we will primarily use the term EHR rather than switching back and forth between the various terms, even though some of the earlier systems did not quite conform to these definitions. Now on to the history. An early informatics leader, Morris Collin, has written a detailed history of the field. His history provides a good picture of the early history of EHRs. In his book, he identifies what were considered the major problems with the paper records of the 1960s. Too often, you couldn't find them, you couldn't read them, and if you did find them and read them, they were not complete. Collins cites studies indicating 5 to 10 percent of clinical encounters took place with no record, and 5 to 20 percent had incomplete records. Recent studies have shown that is still the case. To address these problems, a variety of prototype systems were developed. These early EMRs were developed at innovative institutions, and they were often used elsewhere as well. 
These were actually EMRs according to the NAHIT definition, because although they were used in a variety of places with each place configuring them for their unique needs, there really was not much sharing across institutions at that time. There were even multimedia EMRs that included imaging studies like x-rays and other graphic images. And there were even the predecessors of today's PHRs in the form of portable devices in which patients could carry around their own medical information. Let's look at the early systems. COSTAR was developed in the late 1960s at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston by Octo Barnett and his colleagues. It used the MUMPS programming language, which is the same computer programming language that underlies the system in the Veterans Administration Hospital System, another early developer of EMR systems. MUMPS stands for Massachusetts General Hospital Utility Multiprogramming System. The primary motivation for developing COSTAR was to provide an accessible record for clinicians that would also meet administrative and financial needs, where users could use the system to answer clinical questions and which would facilitate quality assurance activities. COSTAR was an outpatient system. COSTAR had several features that we will see in other systems as well, and which in many ways paved the way for today's EHRs. The features include what they called a directory, which was in essence a data dictionary that described the data fields. It was designed modularly, and the different modules could be combined. Different sites could configure the system to meet their needs. Configuration in this sense meant both selecting which modules to use and what they wanted the data fields within them to mean. Data input was done by structured paper encounter forms that the physicians filled out and clerks entered into the system. The database could be queried to answer user questions, and it included administrative, financial, and clinical data. Over the years, multiple institutions adopted the system, keeping the basic system, but configuring the features to meet their unique needs. Another early system was called TMR. TMR sounds a bit more exotic than what it stands for, which is the medical record. It began at Duke University in the 1970s. Ed Hammond and William Stead were the main developers. It began initially in the obstetrical outpatient clinic as a mechanism to facilitate taking an obstetric history and eventually expanded to other departments and functions. If we look at the features of TMR, even though it ran on different hardware and software than that of CoStar, we see many design similarities. TMR was also built with a modular design. New applications would be developed and integrated into the system as needed. It also included data definition dictionaries. Because of user preferences and also the type of data, it included both problem-oriented and time-oriented formats. Problem-oriented formats organized the data around the patient's clinical problems. Time-oriented formats organized the information in a chronological sequence. TMR allowed multiple methods of input, including directly entering data into the computer, paper input, and dictation. So the data included both structured and unstructured data. It allowed for maximal flexibility in terms of configuration, content, and data input method. It expanded to multiple sites, and although most sites that initially used it have switched to newer systems, there are still a few sites using it. The Regenstrief Medical Record System, or RMRS, was developed by Clement McDonald and William Tierney and colleagues in the 1970s at the Regenstrief Institute in Indianapolis, Indiana. It also began as an outpatient system, but this time in the diabetes clinic. 
It eventually expanded to other outpatient and inpatient units at several Indianapolis hospitals. The initial goals were to capture data electronically, so the data in the record could be analyzed and used to provide reminders and other decision support to clinicians. While other systems aimed primarily to increase accessibility of information and also added some decision support, the RMRS was intended from the outset to provide decision support, and to do that, the data had to be captured electronically. Some of the features of the system included electronic interfaces wherever possible. So, for instance, if there were electronic devices that monitored a patient's blood pressure, the developers would try to connect the output from that device so it could be automatically recorded in the medical record. Like the other systems, RMRS used a variety of input methods. Although it allowed dictation as input, coders using a data dictionary recoded the unstructured data so that it was stored in structured and coded form. That coding facilitated both information retrieval and decision support. Over time, more direct computer data entry by physicians occurred, especially for more structured kind of data like laboratory and medication orders. RMRS's clinical decision support was extremely widespread and sophisticated and grew over time. The data in the record are reviewed automatically using hundreds of rules and reminders for preventive measures and other types of reminders and alerts are provided to the physicians. Decision support has been provided since 1974, and McDonald and his colleagues have done research studies showing the effectiveness of these reminders on reducing costs and improving patient health outcomes. Like the other systems, RMRS has integrated administrative and financial functions into the database. It has also expanded to multiple inpatient and outpatient facilities. If we look at some of the common features of these early systems, we can see some of the best practices and key features that one should look for in an EHR. Ed Hammond, in a 2001 article, discussed some of the lessons we can learn from the early systems. They all were developed in a modular fashion to meet the changing needs of both clinical and administrative users. They initially began with easy-to-capture data and moved on to more challenging data sources. They were designed to be flexible and configurable for different settings and different users. They allowed multiple methods of data input, but tried to get the data into more structured form for storage and retrieval. In all three places, this involved a data dictionary so that it was clear what was contained in each part of the record and what the codes meant. Especially with the RMRS, there was an effort to use agreed-upon technical standards to facilitate information sharing. All three systems in their outpatient systems integrated the administrative and clinical data. Hospital systems often have different ways of handling this information, but in outpatient settings, many of the pieces of data are collected simultaneously, and it makes sense that the same system could be used for both purposes. All of the systems began with clerical staff entering the data, but eventually began to move to direct entry by physicians. For example, orders for laboratory tests and medications are by nature more structured than documentation of the clinical encounter. The clinical encounter is the history and physical examination of the patient. By beginning with order entry rather than clinical documentation, the physician can get accustomed to using the system and then move on to more challenging input. Finally, another best practice that was advocated was extensive user training and support. These principles exemplified in these early systems are still relevant today.
Despite the early successes of these and other EHR systems, as Colin notes in his book, as late as 1990, there were still barriers. These included the costs of hardware and software, the fact that most existing systems could not easily accommodate unstructured data, and that the design of many of the systems was still not optimal. In most cases, the user interface, that is, how the system looks to the user and what the user has to do to use it, was cumbersome. And with some exceptions, the existing systems of the day did not adequately support the physician's cognition. That is, they did not help the physician think through the patient's problem and treatment. In addition, data entry was still difficult. However, at that time, the greatest barrier was probably lack of physician acceptance or interest. Do these barriers sound familiar? Many of them are still barriers today. As Collins saw it as we were entering the 1990s, there were five main goals that an EHR system needed to meet. The information needed to be accessible when and where it was needed. The system should improve efficiency and reduce costs as well as improve the quality of patient care. It should also facilitate research on the delivery and outcomes of care. Moreover, since hospitals have to survive, it should facilitate claims processing as well as clinical functions. If we look at the vision for the provisions of the HITECH Act of 2009, we again see echoes of those earlier goals. As articulated by Dr. David Blumenthal, the Director of the Office of Health Information Technology, the HITECH Act goals include improved health and population outcomes, increased transparency and efficiency of health care, the improved ability to study health care, as well as improved care delivery. In the next presentation, we will look at the recommendations for designing an EHR to reach those goals. This concludes Lecture A of History of Electronic Health Records. In summary, we discussed how both the terminology and concepts behind the electronic health record have evolved. We also discussed some of the early EHRs that were developed and how we have tried to define the requirements for EHRs.